welcome to the medical report. We have an interesting uh, discussion today about a topic that is kind of new to me uh, by terminology, but not by fact, but the term is called boomeritis, B-O-O-M-E-R-I-T-I-S. And with us to discuss that particular title is Dr. Todd Mishner. Uh, Dr. Mishner is an orthopedic surgeon with the Chester County uh, Orthopedic uh, Associates. Uh, he is probably the fifth of that particular group that has uh, uh, spoken to us, and I think as a group we've learned an awful lot about, about bone and joints. So, uh, Todd, thank you very much for, for joining us. And Todd is a graduate of uh, uh, Vanderbilt University Medical School. He went to the University of Virginia prior to that and took his orthopedic training at the University of Pennsylvania. So we have a very talented and well-trained individual with us today. One of the, uh, the, the term boomeritis, uh, it was new to me when you first uh, told me you were going to speak about that. Could you explain what boomeritis means? Sure. Boomeritis really refers to any sports-related injury in a, in a person of the baby boomer generation. And so uh, as people continue to be more and more active later into life, we're seeing more sports-related injuries that uh, we weren't seeing before. And my job as an orthopedic surgeon in sports medicine is to keep people active and doing the things that they want to do at any time in their life. And so uh, boomeritis uh, is sort of this term that's been coined and uh, we use it pretty regularly. Okay, so now we know what boomeritis is, so it's an itis of, of everything that involves <laughs> the, the joints, I guess, at some point. Uh, one of the first topics of, of this is something called epicondylitis. That's E P I. C-O-N-D-Y-L-I-T-S, epicondylitis. So I know uh, maybe we'll have this spelled out for you uh, on, on the screen at some point in time, but could you explain uh, to the audience what uh, epicondylitis is? Sure. Uh, these are terms that you will, uh, you've traditionally heard as tennis elbow or golfer's elbow, and we call that tennis elbow is referred to as lateral epicondylitis, which is inflammation of the tendons on the outside of your elbow, and golfer's elbow is uh, medial epicondylitis, which is inflammation uh, of the tendons on the inside of your elbow. So those are the probably one of the more common things that you will see um, at, uh, later in life as you continue to be active playing various sports or even just doing your normal activities of, of daily living and can be quite debilitating. Yeah. So epicondyles are, are anatomical locations, right, of the bone. Correct. And so the surface area over them is inflamed. Is that the, the process? Pretty much. The, the end of your arm bone, is, uh, your humerus, like you said, has uh, epicondyl, epicondyles and various tendons and, and muscles uh, insert into that area and you get irritation of, that, of those muscle tendons that cause pain. Yeah. So it's more of a soft tissue injury rather than a bony injury. Correct. Okay, very good. So when you say tennis elbow, what are the common causes? I mean, I'm playing tennis, obviously, if it's called tennis elbow, but Correct. what actions cause tennis elbow? Typically, I, I, the terms tennis and uh, golfer's elbow, I think, are... Um, not truly accurate because I always say about 98% of people that have either one of them don't play tennis or golf and it's typically just a repetitive uh, use of that arm reaching and grabbing pulling uh, hammering painting um, scrubbing those types of repetitive activities can cause problems in this area so these pains that 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 develop are located right on the outside? Typically, the most common one would be tennis elbow, where people get a sharp stabbing pain on the outside of their arm when you go to grab a doorknob, uh, shake somebody's hand, or you try to pour a coffee, your coffee mug or grab a gallon of milk, mm -hmm. uh, and they get a sharp stabbing pain right in this location. So anything that causes any kind of a rotational motion is going to aggravate it, I suppose? Correct. Yeah, okay. So when you get one of these inflammatory episodes, or is there a distinction between an acute form and a chronic form? Yes, there is. I, I think with an acute form, it is due to over a weekend or some specific activity you've been doing, you get, start getting this sharp stabbing pain um, that sits there. And so in those, uh, and how we treat those are a little bit different. So when we're in an acute form where, you know, this past week or a couple of weeks ago, it's really started getting irritated. You, you know, the best 
uh, therapy is rest. I'll often put people into what I call a cock-up wrist splint that will allow, uh, hold the wrist in a relaxed position to allow these muscles that have been irritated to calm down. And typically, a, some sort of anti-inflammatory medicine like ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve uh, can be helpful during the acute episode. Um, sometimes a topical anti-inflammatory gel can be helpful as well. So if, if one of our more enthusiastic golfers takes the larger than usual divot that upsets our greenskeepers, yes. uh, well, what will happen to his elbow? <laughs> Depends uh, uh, which side it is. If it's your lead arm, I mean, if it's, uh, yeah, if it's your lead arm, you'll get tennis elbow. If it's your follow-through arm, you'll there get you golfer's elbow. And that's how you get golfer's elbow. But a lot of people, when you hit, when you hit it fat, will, you know, the repetitive nature of coming down will really irritate their left arm, or the right hand of their left arm, and it will become so, quite sore. So Hopefully think, you only do that once or twice around. Yeah, and I hope that's good prevention exactly. explanation to our, <laughs> to our viewers here. That's wonderful. Um, so you said something about a leave or topical thing. What other treatments are, are, are usually used for, for these uh, disorders? Yeah, once you get past that acute flare-up and it becomes a more persistent or chronic problem, typically uh, I'll do uh, a few things. If, if it's, uh, it's been going on for a while and it's been quite painful, sometimes we'll consider a cortisone shot into the area of maximum uh, tenderness. We call it lateral epicondylitis and we think of it as inflammation, but after a while it really becomes more of a degenerative process. And so, uh, but we still treat it like an inflammatory process. So a cortisone shot will be something I will consider. Um, then we typically get into a stretching program where we work on stretching our wrists this way and that way, and that will tend to stretch the muscles. And then um, after we can calm down some of the pain, then we work on a strengthening program that will help make this go away. Is surgical intervention ever necessary for either of these? It is in rare cases. I would say 98% of the time these are typically tend to be self-limiting problems and um, it's after if you've had symptoms for more than six months, you failed sort of exhausted conservative uh, treatment, uh, sometimes we require surgery. And there's two ways that you can do that. There's one open um, where you go in there and you remove the diseased area, or there's an arthroscopic way where you just make two little poke holes and go in with a, a little camera and remove the diseased area. And that's typically the way I do it because there's less soft tissue injury. Um, I don't have to violate any of the normal structures to repair the problem, and it typically is a re quicker recovery that way. But again, most of the time surgery is not necessary. Well, let's move up the, the road a little bit from our elbow to our shoulder. Yes. Uh, these athletes are around here really are worried about their shoulders Absolutely. too, you know, and so um, the first uh, thing we're going to talk about is a frozen shoulder. Uh, this is something that, um, that's fairly common, isn't it? It is. Uh, and could you describe to our viewers what a frozen shoulder is and perhaps what, what causes it? Sure. A frozen <laughs> shoulder is uh, not the most common. Well, one of the common issues I'll see uh, in uh, in the shoulder that can be quite debilitating actually. And what it is, is basically a, uh, a painful uh, shoulder that ultimately loses its range of motion. And so if we look at a shoulder, a shoulder is a ball in a socket, and there's muscles on the front, top, and around the back, that's your rotator cuff. But underneath it is a capsule which has the ligaments and everything that holds the shoulder together. And with a frozen shoulder, the capsule in the shoulder becomes very inflamed very irritated and over a period of time it thickens up and your motion becomes quite restricted okay. and it can be extremely painful. Um, and what are the most common causes of a frozen shoulder? So uh, the, one of the more common <coughs> causes, the most common causes is probably idiopathic meaning it just happens for whatever reason. Uh, you can't, uh, it typically happens more commonly in females than in males. <coughs> typically between 40 and 70 is the average age range that you'll see it. People with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or hypothyroidism are a little bit more likely to get it. Um, but that's the most common form. But then you also have post-traumatic, meaning you slipped and fell and you injured your shoulder. So um, in those cases, the best treatment for that is preventative. So you slip and fall, you injure your shoulder, you go to the emergency room, you go to your doctor, and they shoot an x-ray, nothing's broken. 
sometimes they'll put you in the sling. And the first thing I do is I say, get rid of that sling. Because if we just keep you immobilized this for a period of time, you will stiffen up and you can stiffen up rather quickly. Mm -hmm. And then if we develop a frozen shoulder, it can be quite debilitating. And So the message is, even though it hurts, you need to start moving it a little bit. Yeah, gentle. I say always yeah, take a nice gently, hot shower. Gently, yep. Use that moist heat to sort of help uh, loosen you up and start moving it around. Try to take it through the range. Of exactly. The just gently walk your hand up the wall, use a cane or a broom to sort of gently move your arm side to side. Mm -hmm. yeah. is there, does that ever require surgical intervention? That does, uh, occasionally. Most times uh, with a frozen shoulder, again, it, it in itself is uh, self-limiting. I say the natural history is it will get better with time, but it can take 18 to 36 months to get better. Sometimes even if you have some of the diabetes or some of these endocrine issues, it can take up to four years to get better. And so there, I would say there's many phases to a frozen shoulder. There's sort of the freezing inflammatory phase where it's really painful. Early on, you may get misdiagnosed with tendonitis or something like that because your motion is pretty well preserved. But then after that, we sort of see the, uh, then you freeze up. And that can take six to nine months to develop. And then you get the frozen phase where the pain subsides. Um, and, then, uh, and then there's a thawing phase where it gradually you regain your range of motion. So it will get better, but it can take a while. So our goal is obviously to make that happen at a much quicker pace. Yeah. One of the things that people frequently ask is, what's the difference between tendonitis and bursitis? And is the treatment different and, and, ha and so forth? Could you explain that a little bit? Sure. The, the term in the shoulder, at least tendonitis and bursitis are exactly the same thing. And so um, you say, oh, my doctor said I had a little bursitis, a little tendonitis. It, that is, they are, the treatment is exactly the same. They are exactly the same thing. And really in the shoulder, that's <clears throat> called impingement syndrome, which means, uh, again, you've got the muscles on the front, top, and around the back. And then there's a bursa that sits above the rotator cuff, and there's this arch of bone up here, and I have a picture here to show you, but as you reach up to grab overhead, you're impinging the bursa and tendon underneath there, causing the bursitis and tendonitis. So they're basically the same, okay. and the treatment's the same. So we're going to talk a little bit about the rotator cuff, because this is one of the more important things, isn't it, that, Absolutely. that we need to talk about. So we're going to perhaps start with the rotator cuff issues. Perhaps you could explain to, to our viewers what the rotator cuff is and then a little bit about what are the issues with it. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the rotator cuff is basically a collection of muscles and their tendons that insert around the shoulder and literally form this cuff of tissue around. So again, on the front, top, and around the back. And it basically allows you to move, um, arm to move in various uh, locations. And so when you irritate the rotator cuff, and it typically happens with life, it's not doing anything specific. A lot of repetitive overactivity can cause it, but even just doing your normal activities of daily living can cause problems. And so what people typically will present with is pain, but it's not in their shoulder. A lot of, it can be in their shoulder, but a lot, most of the time, they'll complain of pain in the outside of their arm. And so they'll say, my arm hurts. It feels like it's muscular, but it's really coming from the shoulder. So that's the classic uh, symptom of rotator cuff or any shoulder problem is arm pain. Mm -hmm. Typically hurts with overhead activity, reaching back to grab something, um, reaching to reach behind your back to put on a bra or uh, wash back in that area can be quite uh, painful. And just like any of these shoulder problems, often what brings them in to the doctors is they hurt at night. Mm -hmm. is they have, night pain is probably the most common thing uh, that you know, laying on that side becomes difficult um, or it keeps them up at night and then they'll typically seek medical treatment at that time. How do you distinguish between a rotator cuff problem versus a, a tendonitis or bursitis? Well, so if you have rotator cuff tendon, the big difference I think is between tendonitis and bursitis and a tear. And um, I think it's, it's really a spectrum of an injury. So you start out with tendonitis and bursitis, then you go down to a partial thickness rotator cuff tear, and then a full thickness rotator cuff tear. And they present all very similarly in terms of how the people feel. But the main difference is when I examine them, um, they're weak. And uh, that's sort of the uh, thing that differentiates it, is when I isolate the various muscles around their shoulder, if they're weak, then I'm more concerned about a tear. So it's a physical diagnosis that, that really makes a distinction. Correct. We're going to come back for a second section 
of this and talk a little bit more about rotator cuffs and, and so forth. So stay tuned and we'll be right back.